uh, I'm the owner, Michelle and I are owners of uh, Galloping Goat Pumpkin Patch and Galloping Goat Grazing. So the pumpkin patch is a weird thing, right? So that's what we've always done. It's been our family business. That's where the goats came in. We have a, we've always had goats there uh, for entertainment, education. They have a uh, large online presence. That's what Claire's getting some of this set up. I've over all of my platforms about a million followers uh, that love the goats and we do a lot of stuff on there and it's really exciting. But um, the pumpkin patch has always been kind of the host for our, our goats. Well, that was all kind of the thing until COVID, right? And that just, that just changed everybody's world. So during, when COVID hit, um, our state shut down any uh, public gatherings, so we couldn't host our pumpkin patch. So we had all these goats, and I think at the time we had somewhere around 50 or so. And I told Claire and Nick, I said, we need to start selling off uh, goats and all this. I don't know how long this pandemic's gonna last, so let's get ahead of it. And uh, so they started selling goats, and I don't know, they probably sold 20, 20 plus goats somewhere. And then they came to me and said, hey, why don't we start renting these goats out for backyard weed control? Well, that's an interesting idea. I mean, shoot, why don't we give it a try? We're not doing anything else. We're stuck at the house. We got to pay for the goats. So we started doing that. And um, I started posting it online. Like, hey, we've got these goats. Let's go and, uh, you know, if, if you've got weeds in your backyard, let us know. So we started doing this. People, and, and it, our phone started ringing off the hook. Claire was kind of uh, coordinating everybody. And all of a sudden we're going into backyards and we're doing people's, uh, you know, pull up with a trailer load of goats and unload them and there we go. This is one of the first uh, first yards that we did, a yard full of uh, tumbleweed and silver leaf nightshades um, and uh, goat heads. And the goats just went to town and loved it. Well, around the same time, I get a call from this really wacko dude. Yeah, but, uh, This guy over here, Todd's like, he calls me up and says, hey, man, I need some goats. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, I'm the, uh, the uh, Burnley Oak uh, District Forest Manager, and I think I can utilize goats in some of my land management projects in the Bosque and some of the open spaces and that thing. I'm like, wow, that sounds great. Okay, so what do we need to do? So he goes, well, will your goats eat salt eater? I'm like, I don't know. He says, will they eat Russian olive? I said, I don't know. He says, well, what about uh, elms? I'm like, I don't know. He says, what about ravenagrass? I'm like, Todd, man, I've been raising goats for a long time, but we've been, we feed them hay, and we just recently started feeding them weeds. I think they'll eat all that stuff, but I don't have firsthand knowledge of it. So he's like, well, what are we gonna do? I said, well, so we, we set up this project, a, a pilot project. We got together with Anthony uh, down in, and Joan there in, in Corrales, and uh, we found some spots that had all of those things that Todd was asking me about. And so, um, and I put Claire and Nick here because it's, it's all their fault. Uh, the reason that we're grazing goats because they had this great idea one day. Um, and by the way, uh, we, we mentioned all of these guys, but uh, Nick and, and Lucas are our full-time grazers. Claire was one of the OGs. She was one of our original grazers. Now she's a full-time mom of my grandson, so that's awesome. And my sons are uh, they're, they're part time, and they come in and help out. So anyway, that's why these two knuckleheads are here. Uh, but we picked a day. We did a four day uh, test project where each day we targeted uh, one of these different things: salt cedar, Russian olive, vinaigrette, elm. And guess what? The goats ate it all. They loved it, right? And, and it, it was fantastic. So that got a deeper conversation between Todd and me. He's like, "All right, this is all. Now I need you to become a vendor for the state." And I'm like, oh, okay, how do we do that? So he walked me through that process. We became a vendor, and he's like, okay, I'm gonna start working on projects. You go get more goats. Okay, so Claire, Nick, and I, we went around the state, and we uh, we gathered up a whole pile of, of goats to get this going. And so since that fateful day with Todd and, and Anthony and Joan and the, and the, the Corrales Bosque, um, we have been busy. The goats have been doing all that they can to eat as much as they possibly can. We started off, uh, we jumped over uh, the river there, and uh, I'm gonna go through some of these highlights, and we'll come back to a couple of these. But some of the big projects that we've been doing, uh, to date we've done about 150 acres. Uh, as of now, that, this was a week ago, it's probably about almost 160 acres now uh, that we've been grazing over there in uh, the Sandia Pueblo, the, the site of the Romero fire in 2012. We're gonna talk more about that in a minute. We just got done working with Joanne uh, over here uh, on the Montano fires uh, area. Great project, but oh my goodness, the kosha, never seen anything like it. Unreal. We'll talk some more about that. 
We've done a bunch of kosher treatment there in Willow Creek in uh, Rio Rancho, the Rio Rancho Bolski there. Same thing, a lot of uh, crazy kosher growth. Anthony, um, remember the Romero fire deal? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, can, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Uh, we want uh, some of the interesting projects we've done Candelaria Nature Preserve. We've done some work over there where we're clearing out uh, irrigation ditches so that uh, they can actually go and irrigate things because these ditches just get uh, plumb full of. So we've done a lot of Johnson grass and uh, field bindweed management for them over there. Uh, working with the Albuquerque Open Space, we've done a bunch of kosher treatment up in Harris over the last couple of years. We're down on Los Lunas the site of the good fire and uh, I think Yasmin you might have gone down there on that we we got in there to do some uh, uh, tree re-sprouts and then we had to pull out in, in April you talk about a jungle that thing turned into it was unbelievable but we did uh, about five acres of uh, tree re-sprouts down there um, so that's all that's kind of where we've been doing now what is this thing called uh, prescribed or targeted goat grazing because conventional wisdom says, well, it's just, this is just goats, you just throw them out there and they eat. It's actually a pretty precise process, and a lot of you already, you, you already know about prescribed type management plans. But let's, uh, you know, when it comes to goats, it's like going to the doctor, right? Anything that we're, any prescribed plan that we have, uh, if you go to the doctor, you've got an ailment, she's going to decide, you know, what is the appropriate treatment to improve your health or maintain your health. The same thing that we're doing with all of our, with our land. We're working with land managers, all of you, to figure out what's the prescribed method for how we want to improve our, our land and, or how we want to maintain it. So the goats become part of that prescriptive plan. And the targeted part, see, we can, when we talk about goat grazing, we'll call it prescribed goat grazing, targeted goat grazing, contract goat grazing. I use all of those because all of those are true. The targeted part of goat grazing is, is really where we get down to the meat of it, the nuts and bolts. We've got this prescribed plan that we're gonna use goats, but then we're gonna target certain things. So everybody does it, all of the land managers, we're gonna, we're gonna look at just like if we're gonna do chemical treatment on Russian olive stumps. We're targeting stump, uh, you know, Russian olives so that we can manage those and then also so we don't damage a lot of our natives like New Mexico olive something like that. We do the same thing with goats. So we're not just rolling into a place, opening up the trailer and say, go get them. You know, we'll come back in a little bit and see what you've done. So how do we do that, right? What do you, how do you do it with a bunch of goats? Uh, so this is kind of the process I brought. Um, this is like our, our most important tool that we have besides the goats is our fencing. So it's portable electric netting that you can carry this. I think this is about 100, 150 feet, 160 feet of fencing. And uh, the guys take it out, and you see Garrett and Nick. We're setting it up. Uh, it's controlled by a 12 volt battery uh, with an energizer. You just hook that up, and it sends a current uh, through the fence. That keeps the goats contained where we want them. Keeps every, keeps everything out else out. I'll talk about that in a minute. But when we do talk about targeting, so you can see, like this is just a few days ago over on the Sandia Bosque. Uh, we're targeting uh, uh, tumbleweed, a Russian thistle growth over here, but we've got native growth over there. Anything that we can get growing over there is huge. So we've got a lot of this young willow coming up. And so we're working our fencing around that so that we're managing the tumbleweeds and not damaging our natives. So we do a lot of that. The guys uh, are out there uh, whenever we, you know, we're working with, whether it be any of our land managers out there, uh, Michael Scalone couldn't come today, Shell, but uh, we're working with him targeting areas and knowing what we're not, what we don't want to eat. So this, this kind of thing happens every day, all day, where we're working at, uh, on the uh, vegetation that we want gone and protecting the stuff that we don't. So more of the logistics of how we do what we do. Pretty simple. We haul goats in trailers. Uh, we can haul with our two trailers about 230 goats at a time. So that's what we're going out with every day. Our goats are unionized. They work the nine to five pretty much every day. So we take them out in the morning, they come back in the evening and they try to take breaks during the day and we try not to let them. But and health, um, and health benefits? Yeah, yeah, they got lots of health benefits. <laughs> like they got a, a great meal plan too. Um, so it, it's pretty much that. Now, we don't always have to get right to our, tar our, our targeted grazing area. Um, we were just there in the Montano uh, Bosque and we were, we were running the goats or herding them, uh, you know, the equivalent of about three football fields to get where we needed to go so that we could, uh, we could graze there and then come back. Now, how do you do that, right? 
That's how we do most all of our work, moving the goats. That, that little dog right there, she's about that big, and she runs 230 goats like it's no problem. So the combination of her and these knuckleheads over here and our fencing is what allows us to do that targeted approach uh, to, to our grazing. So one of the things you wanna look at is say, we've got, uh, we've got the goats back here in the background. We practice what we call um, high intensity, low duration grazing. So we're gonna pack as many goats into an area as possible for a very short amount of time. So whatever that prescribed method is that we've come up with, it's like, well, sometimes we wanna take that vegetation all the way to the dirt. Sometimes we just wanna trim it and go on. Whatever that is, that's part of our management plan. And so these guys are there with them all the time and they're watching the goats. When we get to that, that goal, that level that we've decided, then it's time to move them. So we might have 230 goats in a, a one eighth of an acre, a quarter of an acre, and but they might only be in there for an hour. They may be in there for three hours. It depends on the, the density and the type of vegetation we've got. Well, as soon as we've reached that management level in there, these guys, they're, they're while the goats are grazing, they're setting up another area, another pen, either right next door or right, you know, right down the way. And as soon as those goats are done, then between her and them, they run them into the next area and go on. And so we just do this leapfrog effect with our fencing all day long. And sometimes we might have, uh, be in a place where uh, we might just move them maybe once or twice during the day, maybe sometimes 10 times during the day. It depends on the, again, the type of vegetation, the density, the size, all of those things and what the management plan is. Like Todd was saying, you know, it's not only invasives that we're doing, but from a, from a preventative maintenance program of even going in and we can do uh, native treatments where we're just going in, just like you might go out with a hedge trimmer and just kind of trim that stuff so that we're either reducing the fire load or, uh, or just promoting more growth. Uh, so that's all part of that prescriptive plan. You, wouldn't, you would be amazed at how often I get asked. No, the number one question I get asked is, do you give the goats water when they're out there working? So yes, we give the goats water. So I always gotta make sure that I show everybody. We supply um, our own uh, storage tanks and depending on where we are, depends on how we get our water. On the San Diabosque, uh, their crews fill the water up for us. We do it there. Um, over at Montano, we haul our own water. Sometimes we're hooking into a faucet we're pulling out of an irrigation ditch or a pond or something like that, make sure that the goats always have hot water. Happy, healthy goats eat a lot more than dehydrated goats. Protecting goats, a lot of questions are like, how are, there, how are the goats protecting us? We're out there, you know, there's coyotes, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, right? Um, these guys, they have, they're with them all the time. So we don't go and just drop the goats off and leave. We're, it's, a high, it's, a, it's a high management process. Um, so the guys are always there. Uh, watching over the goats, doing their thing, but our fencing also. Uh, it's keeping goats in, right? But it's also keeping animals out. Maybe worse than coyotes or domestic dogs. That's the biggest problem we've ever had. And um, we were just in a, uh, at the Montano fire site, and there, I tell you what, the amount of people that go through there, walking their dogs, whatever, and we had two different occasions that I saw uh, was there for where the dogs, whether they were wanting to eat the goats or play with the goats, one of the two, they, they, they were off leash and they went to get in with the goats. The fence bit them and that's all it took. So it protected them from that. So we're able to protect our goats like that. I wanna go back now and talk specifically about a couple of projects, the Romero, the, the Romero fire spot and the Montano fire. Um, we have been over here uh, since that day in September of 2021, uh, doing a whole lot of different type of management. So. I, a lot of you are familiar with this particular fire. It started in, uh, in Corrales, and I think it only burned maybe seven, nine acres or something like that. So somewhere in that range, and it was an e-cigarette that started it, is that right? So someone dropped an e-cig, lit the whole thing up. Well, I feel like, wow, Corrales really dodged a big bullet there because if the winds had been doing something different, it could have been rough. We talked about that wildland urban interface. Right, Corrales and, and the Bosque is just intertwined. Prevailing winds were blowing from west to east. It jumped the river and over on the Sandia Pueblo side. The, 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 the good thing is there was, there's not a lot of people over there. there were, nobody was hurt to my understanding. It's just all, it was just all Bosque. Burned almost 360 acres over there uh, on that side. And well, Where'd it go? Well, that's the wrong one. Well, okay. 
what that that's basically what the Bosky looks like over there. It was going to be a picture of barren nothingness. I call it the uh, um, I call it the old growth cottonwood graveyard because you can kind of see it here, but there's just it's just these old cottonwoods laying. It's everywhere, you know, and and uh, most of the soil is is very barren over there. Um, but what happened in that fire? It burned so hot and so intense. It basically um, it, it burnt all the nutrients out of the soil. So the only thing that's coming back right now really is tumbleweeds. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And we're getting some willow growth, some baccarat, a little bit of New Mexico olive, and uh, now just starting to see a few thing, a few other things. But this is what we're doing almost every day. Yes, sir. Are they eating dry tumbleweeds? They are. Yeah, goats are amazing, right? <laughs> it's unbelievable. unbelievable. The, hard prickly sticky yeah i know it's unbelievable what they do so we're eating it green and we're eating it brown also so this is uh, uh this was last winter this uh, but this is what we do we were out there doing this today uh on a, a pretty normal deal so we're doing the the tumbleweed treatment we're doing right now is fire fuels reduction because now it's this massive fire hazard again that we don't want to have happen but we're also trying to do invasive management prior to them going to seed so that we can start to reduce the overall load because this is, you know, 100 acres of, of tumbleweeds that's going on over there. So we're working really hard to do, uh, try to do some preventative maintenance as well. Uh, talking about um, re-sprouts. So this was just a few days ago. We had a Russian olive. This is a Russian olive uh, re-sprout. Uh, and then <coughs> after the goats are done with it, and that's what happens. They love young Russian olive, salt, cedar, and elm. Elm might be the most glorious food that a goat could ever eat. Yes, sir. Do they ever eat so much they stop eating? No, they don't stop. It's unbelievable. It's, it's, they just go. These things are, I'm amazed by them because. Only the sheep take a break. Yeah, the, yeah. the sheep are much more unionized than the goats. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But the goats, every once in a while, they'll kind of stop, they'll chew their cud, and then they get back up and they get after it. I think, so part of the reason we do, it, well, well, one of the benefits of our intensified grazing is they, they're so competitive and curious, right? They make these little noises like, ooh, I found an elm tree, and all 200 of them, oh my goodness. You know, so it's, it's pretty fun to watch, but that kind of thing happens all day long, and it just, and it just keeps on going. So... One of the other benefits that we're, you, we see with goats that we're gonna talk about, I know Todd loves big tractors and stuff. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. But when a goat eats something, it goes in this end, goes comes out the other end, right? So they're eating bad stuff, but when they coming out the other end, it's good stuff, right? So we're in an area where the soil is depleted, whether it be on Sandia or over in Montano, the, the fire has it sucked all the nutrients out of the soil. And so, how do we get that back in? We got to put, uh, you know, organic matter back in. And so goat manure and urine has, is a fantastic, it's a, it's a ready-made, uh, it's one of those, those manures that's considered, I guess, cold. It can be applied right to the garden right away, right out the chute and it's ready to go. And so um, this last year, there's a, we've got a lot of grasses coming back, salt grass coming back, tall, uh, um, uh, uh, Sacatone, there it is, uh, tall sacatone. But this this summer we had this beautiful bloom of uh, Rocky Mountain uh, bee plant, and it was just everywhere. But we got in as part of our management area amongst all of that Rocky Mountain bee plant, where all of this the tumbleweeds coming up, all this Russian thistle is coming up all around. All of these, we've got there's bees and butterflies everywhere. And we're like, oh no, you know, we've got to try to target this Russian thistle. Well, we found out that goats will not eat Rocky Mountain bee plant. They won't even touch it. You know, it's like they eat everything else in the world, but they won't touch this. So we're able to go right in there and they just go bypass all of that great pollinator plant and eat everything else. Yes, ma'am. I was always told that one of the big advantages of the goats is that their digestive system allows them to digest the plants and seeds completely. Yeah. So they're not spreading the seeds yep. unlike other livestock. Yep. So I'm, so I'm not an expert on this, but the studies that I've read, 
um, that we get a goat will get about a 90 to 100 percent kill off. Is that what you found as well? Yeah, it depends on the seed size, but the species we have here are small seeds, so they're finding only about 11 percent of um, the seed is actually surviving, coming out viable um, and germinating in a lab. So right. those are controlled conditions. So what's actually germinating out in the wild is probably going to be much lower. They had up to 40 percent, but those would be large fruit seeds that we're not dealing with in these areas. I mean, and that's a big thing, you know, because there's obviously a, there's a lot of considerations when we use, we call it, we like to call it vegetation management, yeah. not so much grazing, because people get the idea True. that, you know, I'll just bring my cows over here, and she'll <laughs> yeah. and we'll, and we'll help you guys out, right? <laughs> that's not really the case, but yeah, the advantage of using goats and why we don't really use these cows and things like that is because we don't want to spread. Yeah, I love the vegetation management angle because that, that really is what it is, for sure. It's all about that. Um, so we're seeing some great results over there. Uh, we've been there now, we're going into our fourth year or fourth season of grazing. Uh, over there, like I said, 150 to almost 160 acres as of, we just came out of the Boston today. Uh, Garrett and Lucas and I were grazing there today. But you can start to see, I mean, this is, this is this is within this area, and even here, um, we've got the dead cottonwoods, but the new the new bosky is coming back, right? The willows, the uh, privet, uh, or the next koala, the, the bacchus, some tall uh, um, uh, sacatone, but amongst all of that is still this unbelievable growth of Russian thistle, you know, tumbleweeds. And so we're, we're fighting two battles. We're trying to get it before it, you know, before it seeds out and, Try to get it out of there so it's not. Uh, <laughs> you nope. didn't have to do that. It's fantastic. fantastic. Thank you. Um, but try so it's not choking out our native uh, vegetation that's trying to come back, um, but also trying to make sure that we're getting it because uh, from a fire standpoint, you know, this is a bit major fuels management issue because now we've got all of this new bosky growth that is fantastic. And it's it's just like we're teetering on this this danger kind of level. But the goats, they love to eat. They're like, let's go, you know. And so again, and from a targeting standpoint, we can't probably see it, but we have fencing that kind of wraps right around this area at the base of all these trees, and targeting in this area and avoiding that uh, in, at the same Let time. Let me bring up one of the things, Sandy. Well, you know, we, the question we asked is, uh, are you worried about the willows or the basker skin inside the the zone and what he said is it's growing as a bush and he wants it to grow more as a tree so they wanted the goats to prune it up to the as far as they could go yeah and that was a I'm like okay it's been a really that's been a been a nice uh, realization for us over there um, especially the backers and even some of this uh, New Mexico olive and the, obviously the willows uh, the willows what we're finding is as long as they've matured and they've created that kind of that thicker harder bark uh, then they're just raising the canopy on it and they're not stripping the bark. Because if they can on a young tree, when they will strip every, I mean, they love bark. And so we, we you know, the earlier slide that we saw where we're avoiding the, the young willows, those, you know, are, in, are you know, those are dangerous, for, or it's a danger for us to eat those. But on these bigger ones, we can graze right in there. They raise the canopy up and what, uh, like what Shell really loves is then it opens it up and we get all of this growth now underneath those willows where it was shaded out before. Same thing, especially with the Bacchus and the, and the Mexico olive, because it becomes such a thick, dense bush um, that it opens it up a little bit more. And they're feeling like the Bacchus is even healthier now because I think, and I don't know much about this particular plant, that is, we, we watch it bushy, get really bushy, then it starts to shade itself out and you get this whole undergrowth of dead vegetation, which now is, you know, back to being a big fire fuel. So part of that prescriptive plan and the targeting is, uh, you know, if we have some in there and we know that they're not just gonna devour the whole thing, then Shell over there, the manager, he's okay with it because we've seen some pretty good results. Um, so that's, we, we spend almost every day, we, uh, we, we just got re-upped on that contract with State Forestry Department to be in there uh, through uh, June of 2025. So we still got, we got a long ways to go in there and the goats are excited about that. <laughs> All right, I wanna talk about our, our Montano project. We just came off about a week ago, something like yeah. that. Um, we went in there, we did 3.2 acres of uh, kosher treatment in there. My goodness, I have never seen kosher like this before. It was unbelievable. We had 200 and 
30 goats. We run them in. It's like, where'd they go? You couldn't see my little guys because it was unbelievable. This is um, this is front page of the uh, Albuquerque Journal. We'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, but uh, uh, the goats just had, a, a, they had a ball. We had a ball watching them. So if you can, I mean, these, this, this, is, this is eight foot tall. Some of this kosher is unbelievable. I, we have, uh, Lucas, I have a picture. I should have put it in here, but you know, a stump of one of these kosher plants is about this big around and it was, I mean, it's huge. But the goats, I don't know what it is, but they love kosher. That's one of those weeds that whether it's dry or green, they go to town on it and love it. So we went and we did 3.2 acres over there. It took us about two and a half weeks. So we we're doing all, about a quarter of an acre. We've averaged about a quarter of an acre a day over there to get that done. But this place was really amazing to me. One, well, it's beautiful because the blooms were coming over and the, you know, it, was, it was really amazing. This is a before and after. We've got our fence here. Um, you know, and you can see some of the re-sprouts of uh, salt cedar and, and Russian olive that were part of that. And the same thing, the, the, the soil treatment that I think we're getting over there um, is just gonna help that all out. But one of the, you know, there, there's a lot of different things. It's vegetation management, but you can see all of the dead wood standing. This place over there, the people, there's, there's people everywhere. You know, it's a wonderful place to walk. And this is a big danger. So I'm talking with Joanne and Dustin, one of the things was we just got to get it opened up so that other crews can come in and take care of all of this other stuff because you can walk through it beforehand. And so that was kind of one of those additional benefits to having them in. This is an eye-opening place for me. Now we were, we've been to Willow Creek and we've done some stuff over there and there was a lot of people in the, in the near Ranch of Bosque. Um, but this place, so for reference, this is uh, Montano here, Coors right here. Bosky School uh, right here. The yellow was our management area. The red was a, I just, it was a portion of that fire that I outlined. We didn't work in, uh, they'd already had some work done in there. But just looking at the proximity, we talk about our wildland urban interface and much like Corrales, much like Rio, Rio Rancho, it's just, it's there. It's just mixed together. But this, this area right here, you see all of these white lines everywhere? Those are all walking trails, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, so we're we're doing this. We had to close this walking trail off because you know people just they're used to running. We have some people that had earphones on. They're used to running their normal path, and all of a sudden they run into a fence. Like, whoa, what's going on? An electric fence. <laughs> Big signs. That, you we know, we had signs she, caution electric fence in the She had area. signs everywhere that said. <laughs> Careful, you're going to get electrocuted, basically. <laughs> but the amount of the amount of people uh, that come through here is unbelievable, which is very was very eye opening for for me in a lot of ways, um, just from a a safety standpoint, but also from just a, a public, you know, this is it's so amazing that our, you know people can utilize our bosky, this open space. It's beautiful down there. We were seeing, I did not, I didn't know about porcupines, but they're like, you walk around, walk around, there's porcupines everywhere, you know, and beavers and, and then javelinas in there. We just saw deer um, yesterday, but people are, so many people in here. And I had people calling me and saying, they wouldn't even say hi. They just said, are the goats gonna be there today? I'm like, yeah, the goats are gonna be there today. Like, what time? I'm like, they're gonna be there till four o'clock. And they, they just was, well, I'm getting my son out of preschool and we're gonna go, go down there and watch the goats. And this was, it was amazing. Poor Nick and Lucas, their, their, their social meter was just like, <laughs> spend all day talking to people, which is amazing. But, you know, goats are not only an eco-friendly way of doing this, this has really been amazing to us because Todd and I talked early on about tools in the toolbox of how we manage uh, our lands. We've got mechanical, we've got chemical, we've got uh, fire, but we've got goats. And I, th the amazing thing is goats are not only eco-friendly, they're really people-friendly. So Todd's gonna get mad at me because I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bash on his tractors a little bit. So. All right, any questions? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Here was the realization when I was looking at this is and i think all of these methods have their place and they all can be done amazingly and from a vegetation management fire fuels management standpoint but there's 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 a cost reward a risk reward type of measurement you know in the todd's big bulldozer we got fuel going into it and what comes out of it 
is going to be exhaust and a lot of noise, right? And after being there in the in the Montano uh, fire area, I'm like, well, is her mom going to want to take her out there to watch the big bulldozers and masticators and chainsaws? And I mean, it might be kind of fun, but we're going to be wearing we're going to be wearing earplugs and the and the whole deal like that. And so, you know, also looking at if something goes wrong, right? I mean, uh, there's there's big problems. Chemical treatment can be done really well and very effectively, but I doing. So, look at there. Huh? I mean, come on, right? And that's the response we get from everybody out there when we're working with the goats. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Look at it. There's no exhaust. Right. <laughs> I knew you took me out there. Yeah. Day. It, September 9th, 2020, you were there, right? Yeah, you a date. Yeah, exactly. Like, okay, so you can find it. <laughs> we have pictures. We have proof. So they're eating the bad stuff, the invasives, whatever it is. They're nice and happy doing, they're doing their job. They love going to work. They're quiet. And what comes out the back end creates all of this amazing beauty, right? <laughs> I saw that when I did that. The butterflies come out. The kind of, right? Kind of. So, listen. Hey, I don't know about her mom and all that other stuff, but I know her mom will bring her out to watch goats graze because, oh my gosh, they did it in droves out there. It was the highest media request we've ever had as a department, and the posts that we've made are highest views and shares. Unbelievable. Wow. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah. it was. We were inundated. Um, by the way, public, public perception, I mean, come on, it's fantastic. But like Joanne said, every, all three of the major news channels covered it. They all came out on separate days. They called and they're like, we're coming out. Like, came oh, out okay. twice because yeah. another reporter wanted to hold a goat so bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They came out every, so all three of the news channels covered it. We were on the front page of the Albuquerque Journal. I mean, it just goats sell and people love the goats and, and the and the media loves the goats um so that's been fantastic and, the, and that's we've had a lot of uh, coverage over the years nothing like this we had a couple of um, national papers take it up too Did, you know? i haven't seen that but i had somebody yes one of my followers from connecticut told me that they saw the news story in connecticut yeah wow. it went national so, wow another place to have to yeah. Yes, ma'am. Have you thought about doing yoga in the woods? Yeah, well, I know. I, I, we've done yoga. I have pictures of me does in shorts and boots doing yoga. I don't know. I don't know how. That know. was in Corrales of him. It was. It was. That was the last time I did that, by the way. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think from a, it, it checks all the marks, right? It's, it's all of those things. It gets all of the stamps. They're cute. They're quiet. They're friendly. And people love them. And uh, so I'm going to leave you with this. This was part of one of the story, the, the last TV story, and I hope it plays. Come on, you got to do it. That's cute. It's going to play. You think? Yeah. Wait, everyone check your Wi Fi, get off the Wi Fi. <laughs> <laughs> this was, so this lady was the end of, her, of a news story for Channel, I don't know what our last, Channel 13 that came out. And uh, she says, uh, I'll just have to do it. Try, try playing on the on your laptop. I push play on the laptop, so I'm not sure. Not yeah, that's what happened. Anyway, she says, "We love the goats. Anytime we need something cleared, bring back the goats because we love the goats." So there you go. That's what she said, and that's my pitch for goats that are that's awesome. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And, yeah. and it's stuck. There it is. There it is. Any other questions? I love, yes. How, how are we getting all that then? Oh, yeah. So um, because, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Because, uh, and we are, I'm sorry, we are live on TikTok. So that's just pointing at me. Um, but uh, because of our, uh, um, our coverage on, or our following on TikTok, this company, Kenco, donated all of the fencing to us for our goats and all that. So, good job, Kenco. Thank you. What else? Yes, ma'am. So, it's now that you've had, well, first of all, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that the goats can tackle eight foot tall kosher. Yeah. I think that was a question for Clay and State Forestry whether the goats could even get in there. I mean, the stuff came in in one year when yeah. we had flooding. Um, not even the first year after the fire, it came in the second year, and by the end of the summer, it was just. Eight feet tall. 
So I'm, I'm really glad to hear that that's a possibility. Yep. That's good. I mean, now that you had some experience doing some of these different types of projects, where would you, where do you feel, or what circumstances do you feel the goats have been more effective and where have they been less effective? Well, I think we, the project we did, uh, if we say less effective, um, we, uh, we did that project down on Los Lunas. So yeah. we were targeting uh, all of those tree re-sprouts. We hit that at about this time. We got right up to April 15th and went to pull out because of uh, the nesting birds mm -hmm. situation. And I think that's a, that's a timing issue. Um, the goats do a pretty good job on it when it's like this. But what we found, as soon as it starts to green up, you know, those plants are pulling up energy from the roots and now putting it up into the upper part above above soil and starting to leaf out. It changes the dynamic and the chemistry of that plant, and the goats know it. I mean, you saw what they did on that, that Russian olive reef sprout winter time, dormant season. But as soon as we hit growing season, it's a whole different story. They go after that stuff. You know, that's the very first thing that they'll go after, and it's very tender and sweet, I don't know what it is. So from a, a, the standpoint of what's been a struggle is timing of when we hit stuff, uh, especially re-sprouts. The other part of it is just trying to stay ahead of kochia and tumbleweeds because it doesn't take much and they're so fast growing that we go from being doing preventative maintenance or uh, in, in, in the growing season to try to keep them from seeding out, but all of a sudden, you know, we've got tumbleweeds like this and, and kochia like this. So just really being ha having the, the ability to scale up and be able to take care of all that has been, that's one of the challenges that we've got to face it there as well. One that I don't think worked as well is rabenograss. That's what I was gonna ask. Um, I'm sorry, but you just have to dig that up with a shovel because they, they did a great job, but then it just came back. Yeah. Well, I think that's something that we have to look at, and that's this is a this is a land management uh, issue for everybody, is more of a, a continual maintenance plan uh, because we're 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 in reactive mode all the time. I mean, you know what we're doing over there at, at Sandia is all in reaction to this big fire that we had, and you know for whatever it was, but I think that especially with the goats. I mean, if we look back historically to all of the world, I would suppose. But if we look at America, historically, it was the large uh, herbivores that would come through. They're following the rain. They come through and they mow everything down and they move on, right? So they mow it down, they leave their fertilizer behind, and they go on and don't come back for another year. But they're keeping that, man that, that uh, vegetation in check to some degree. And I think that's what a struggle for us is to be able, whether it be uh, native, because native vegetation burns, right native, native vegetation dies off and shades other things out and is similar to an invasive so i what i hope is that we get into this kind of preventative or preemptive type management to where we can be ahead of that because we're spending so much time effort and money to try to restore something that is in this repair it's really a struggle i mean 2012 the the romero fire came through and so much of that bosque is still just bare ground because they can't get anything to grow on it. Um, so that's where I, you know, I'm hoping, and I think that's a place where the goats can really be effective because we can, from a management prescriptive standpoint, we can say, we want to go in there and just trim it. You know, just like you would your, your garden, your roses or whatever at the house. Let's, let's trim it, let's keep it healthy, let's keep it from, from being overgrown, dying out and becoming a fuel source. You have a question. So, have you done? Have you focused on any other rabenograss projects no. other than the test pilot that we it's did? It's the only across? place that we've been. There's no rabenograss over there, and I don't think we saw any, did we? Not there, but I have a spot for you. I mean, yeah, <laughs> on, the north, on the north side of the. Green and I right think the go I think it, the thing with the goats, they're going to they're going to eat that rabenograss, but that's a that's a, ma a maintenance issue that we have to yeah. kind of keep coming back. We're seeing that with the tall uh, the the, the sacatone is it's starting to grow back there in uh, on, on the Sandia side. So we're getting a lot of this great, but it's a bunch grass, right? So it's it's similar to, to Ravenna or Pompous. It's gonna get big and it's gonna get big, but then it's gonna start shading itself out and then you've got this major fuel load. But what we saw, we did with Shell is last year, he's like, well, I don't know if we, let's let's graze some of it, let, let, let's cut some of it with, with goats and, and leave some of it. So those areas where they came through and graze it, it came back so lush and green and beautiful 
The others still came back nice, but you've got all that dead grass to deal with as well. So we, we know over time, like we see with Ravenna, it's gonna just become this big bunch of tender, really. So discussing with the city of Albuquerque here, the strategy, that's one of our things that we're trying to target. And I was showing her some pictures of our pilot project. Yeah. And I kind of disagree with Todd. It, I mean, it, it was successful to the point of the goats got it down to a manageable level. Right. And then we have to go in there and remove the root right. and follow up, like you said, maintenance. Because right. they're going to re-sprout, but we have to keep it on it. Exactly. Um, the other question I had is I've been in contact with the Bureau of Reclamation and trying to come up with a strategy because when you look at our border in Sandia, because we border them, and also we border Albuquerque, but we have these big islands with no management on it. So have you done any sort of testing on islands or have permission to go on an island to utilize your okay. goats? And Not yet. Bureau of Reclamation, so you gotta get another agency. Involved. What's that? Bureau of Reclamation, you gotta get another agency involved. Yeah, but how does it work? if? If it's if there's water in between, then it's Bureau of Reclamation. But if, if the water is receded, then it's no, not necessarily. No, <laughs> it's yeah. That's the question <laughs> I've been trying to figure. Can you out. get both goats across it. water? I guess is the bigger question. Yeah, I'm, that, that would be that'd be another that'd be another <laughs> pilot project. Yeah, it's, it's an airboat. Right. So, so, that's where I'm going with this. Like, if, if you got permission with the landowners, I mean, could that would you be willing to take your goats on an island? So, yeah, well, we sure because. You know, we right there where we were in Montano, at one when we started, there was a big island because it was surrounded all by water. But within a few days, it had receded, or for whatever reason, and that island now was exposed to where you could walk to it. And it, they need it. I mean, there there is a massive fuel load on those things, yeah. and I think that there's a way to do it. Point, Max, that you know, with goats, it's not a one and done thing. And you know, unless you have a continuous funding source. To make sure you can bring them back, you can't really assess whether they've they've killed the plant, whether they've knocked right. it back, that kind of thing. And, and that's kind of the issue we ran into with some of our our goat research projects in the past is just not having them come back right. enough times in different seasons to really assess how successful they could be. So you know, you know, based on my experience with goats, I would say you know, with your woody species, you're better off using a side. It's probably less expensive. But you know, when you're dealing with with weeds and kochia and things where we can't get stuff in the bosque to to really treat, we can't mow down there. Right. Um, you know, or or we have dead fuel loads, things like that. Like maybe turning some grasses. I think those are good places, even ditches. You know, yeah. where we have a, a weed problem or a noxious weed problem. Yep. I think those are those are great opportunities potentially to use goats. And then I think we need more information on how they impact. The non-native woody species. Mm -hmm. I think to really assess, you know, the cost-benefit versus the cost-benefit of being able to go in a couple times with a cut stump treatment or something like that. Mm -hmm. or, Lucas, you or what are the other benefits that ways they can benefit the bosque? Right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I agree. But it's such a great way though to open it up, even if you are going to be doing a cut stump treatment or other or manual removal. Um, most of the time, it's, it's so thick in there. So much of your crew's time mm -hmm. just getting through into there, whereas after the goats, it's kind of it's that first round treatment. And if you even if you are going to follow up with other treatments, they can yeah. be very effective. If that's for that level, right? To go as long as that's part treatment. of that plan, yeah. 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 But it also just considering it as part of the long term maintenance mm -hmm. plan that 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 could be just what you do every year or every other year and figuring out what the timing is versus your targets, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I think that, I'm glad you brought up the question of the timing. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, on regards to that, in the Sandia Bosque, we were talking with the Bosque crew about doing a project where we go into the Elmry sprouts, mm -hmm. and then right after we go through, they were talking about going in and doing a custom treatment on it. So I think it'd be super interesting to see if we can get that project to go through, how that would work yep. and impact the elms. Yep. And then also a good example of the um, like preventative is we did 12 acres down in the San Diego Bosque of two weeks before they went to seed. And that area to this day, as of right now until obviously spring starts again, but that's all been clear since the whole winter. 
Yeah, and we went in uh, early summer, right? On that summer. on that first the first twelve yeah, acres first 12 there. Acres. So yeah. we had yeah tumbleweeds, you know, up to about six eight inches maybe, right, in through there, yeah. and uh, you know took that all the way to the dirt and. The great, yeah, again, the great thing, and I don't know, you know, who knows how much rainfall or whatever we had, but we didn't get any more regrowth on that the rest of the, the rest of the season. So, so yes, sir. You, you mentioned nesting season. So on San Diego, is there a restriction, or can you work year round? They they work year round over there. Okay. Yeah. What was the situation with the nesting season? You, you can probably speak more to that about. Yeah, yeah. migratory. We had a lot of migratory bird nesting in it last year, and so we usually stop our vegetation management activities like April 15th through August 15th. Because, you know, we probably have 80 to 100 species of birds that nest. In the San Diego situation, because it was burned and there's not habitat, mm -hmm. that may make it a lot easier. You know, yeah, nowhere for them to, nowhere to, to nest. <laughs> yeah. me, I, I think Shell does, because as, as you identified, it's a, not a, an immediate habitat, right. and he's also working with fish and wildlife. I think they're doing bird surveys ahead of all those projects. So, yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's an option too if you have that, but it's, you know, that's very cost and yeah, right. I, yeah, so yeah. he's, yeah, they're, they're applying themselves over there, so I think it's yeah. not just open, it's, he's, he's doing he's, consultation he's, and uh, yeah, he's got, he's got some other people involved for sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's something I've talked to Max about looking into is doing small test plots if we're using them obviously it's going to be less invasive than, than the mechanical treatment so if we are if we go in and do a survey and, and no nesting um, birds or the habitat is just so damaged from invasives bringing in small um, doing small treatment areas just to see what what is the effect even we have a FEMA project going on and we have um, elms being cut down and so we've got chainsaws we've got people working and really within about 150 feet of the work the birds are still going they're still doing their thing because we are such an urban area in this urban corridor um, they're used to more disturbance a little bit um, I don't know what the outcome would be but I think it's a really interesting study to look into what is you know what is going to be this is lower disturbance overall as opposed to coming and doing the mechanical treatment so we could work a little bit I would say later in the next day, earlier when they're first setting up their nest, that's a really sensitive time for them, but towards the end, um, when your nestlings are you know, starting to turn into fledglings, um, coming in later in that season, and doing treatment more towards the end, and kind of looking at, again, that time and that prescription and how that would affect things. I mean, it could be, it, I feel like it's really interesting data to look at if we could, if we could get it, so I'm hoping that, um, again, working with through fish and wildlife and seeing what their feelings are on it, so mm -hmm. we can start doing test plots Um, I'll say let's keep this open for maybe something afterwards, but I think these guys close at nine oh. and they know where I live. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, th let's thank Max again for coming yeah. uh, yeah. 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 yeah.